and through thee, that's Jerusalem, I will make thee an eternal excellency, a joy of many generations. Thou shalt also, thou shalt also, also suck the milk of the Gentiles, and shall suck the breast of kings, and thou shalt know that I, the Lord Jehovah, am thy Savior and thy Redeemer, the Mighty One of Jacob. He's the Holy One of Israel, the Mighty One of Jacob, the Messiah, Son of God. That's who's doing the talking here. For brass I will bring gold. And for iron I will bring silver, and for wood brass, and for stones iron. I will also make thy officers peace, and thine exactors righteousness. Violence shall no more be heard in thy land, wasting nor destruction within thy borders. But thou shalt call thy walls salvation, and thy gates praise. The sun shall no more be thy light by day, neither for brightness shall the moon give light unto thee, but the Lord shall give unto thee an everlasting light, and thy God thy glory. Thy sun shall no more go down, neither shall thy moon withdraw itself. For the Lord shall be thine everlasting light, and the days of thy morning shall be ended. In the millennial kingdom of Messiah's rule over Jerusalem, there will not be a tear shed in that city. That's why when Christ rides into Jerusalem on that little donkey, and he starts weeping, and he said, Oh, if thou hast known Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the peace that is due unto thee this thy day. <sighs> Isaiah 60 tells you about that peace. Verse 21. Thy people shall all be righteous. Why? Because the Spirit of God is going to be poured out upon the nation. They'll look upon him whom they pierce. Zechariah 12 verse 10. We're going to have the nation born in a day, Isaiah 66, 8. Can a nation be born in a day? Absolutely right. It's going to happen. And all of the Hebrew Jewish Israelites will be saved. They'll have circumcised hearts, having believed on Mashiach, their Mashiach. It's called national salvation, a national repentance. And they shall inherit the land forever, the land promised to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob. The Abrahamic covenant will be finally fulfilled. The branch of my planting, planting, the work of mine hands that I may be glorified. A little one shall become a thousand, and a small one a strong nation. I, the Lord, will hasten it in his time. Now this is just one chapter of Isaiah, Isaiah 60. And that tells you of the future restoration of the nation of Israel and the city Jerusalem. This is the hope of Israel. So with this understanding, in about 4 or 5 B.C., a huge caravan shows up in Jerusalem from the east. There were not three kings. We three kings of Orion. That's a bunch of Roman Catholic heresy. There was a huge caravan that came out of the east, probably Assyria, or maybe even Babylon. But they came out of the east. These were the wise men of the east. And they had a caravan. There were soldiers to guard the treasures that they were bringing with them. They had food. They had camels. It was a huge caravan. And when this huge caravan shows up in Jerusalem with all these camels and these soldiers and these wise men of the east, they alight from their camels and they go to Herod, the king who's in Jerusalem. And what do they do? Matthew 2, verse 1. Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem. And the first thing they say, probably to the first people they see, is, where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east. 
and are come to worship him. Can you imagine how those Jews of Jerusalem must have felt when they heard this? They see this spectacular caravan and this question put to them. Back in... Continuing on with our broadcast today. And we're going to fix a little something here. So as we continue on with the broadcast, Here are all these wise. Here are the three. Here are the wise men. God deliver me. <laughs> Raised with Roman Catholics, I think like them half the time. Um, here come these wise men from the east. They're not three wise men. They're wise men from the east. They're magi, men of wisdom. And I am sure he, they have ordered their caravan to inquire of anybody they see. Where is he that is born the king of the Jews? For we've seen a star in the east. And I've come to worship him. Worship him? Why, you see, this king of the Jews is very God. If he's to be worshipped, he's very God. To deny his deity is a heresy. They, did, they believed he was God. And I worship in anybody who's not God. At least in the Bible. We've seen a star in the east, and we've come to worship him. We're seeing when Herod, and now this is this is talking about a geopolitical kingdom of the king of the Jews. This is how Herod interprets it. If it was if he just came to establish a spiritual kingdom, Harold Camping, and all you other millennial heretics, if he just came to establish him on a spiritual kingdom, then why does Herod want to kill him? Why does Herod regard him as a threat to his power? Remember, Herod was a vicious murderer. Killed his wife, killed some of his sons. He was a vicious murderer. Even though the Lord used him to embellish the second temple, it's like he used the Assyrian king Artaxerxes to, or pardon me, uh, Cyrus, to order the building of of the second temple. He was a killer. Lord uses Gentile kings for his purposes. It's like he's going to use the Pope to help build the third Hebrew temple. He's going to use wicked Gentile kings to fulfill his purposes. He used a wicked Gentile king, Hiram, king of Tyre, to provide wood for King Solomon. God can use wicked Gentile kings to build his to build his temples. And when Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled. And all Jerusalem with him. I'll bet Jerusalem was troubled. Yeah. I'll bet Herod was troubled. And so what does Herod do? And when he, Herod, had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he demanded of them where Christ, where Messiah, should be born. Why did he want that? Why did Herod want to know where he should be born? Because Herod knew the prophets. He knew the hope of Israel. He knew that there would be coming a one someday who would deliver Jerusalem from its oppression and its bondage, and the one oppressing Jerusalem then was King Herod. So the prophecy directly spoke against Herod. That Jerusalem will be delivered from him and others like him. And the Roman Caesar to boot. This is a geopolitical kingdom, folks. 
There's no such thing as amillennialism. There's no such thing as God's forever done with Israel. There's no such thing as the church has replaced Israel with replacement heretical theology. All that's lies and sin. It has nothing to do with the true church of Jesus Christ. And they said unto him in Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, Thou Bethlehem in the land of Judah art not the least among the princes of Judah, for out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel. Well, that is, that is Micah chapter 5, verse 2. But thou, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me, as to be ruler of Israel. But notice here, the Spirit of God chooses not to complete the prophecy. He cuts it short. That shall rule my people Israel. But what does it continue to say? What does it continue to say? Shall he come forth unto me that is to be ruled in Israel, whose goings forth have been from old, from everlasting? This king of Israel is eternal. And if he is eternal, he is Jehovah. For only Jehovah is eternal. It's going for us to bend from everlasting. And you see, that's why the wise men wanted to worship him, because he was eternal. He was very God. He was Jehovah. He was the second person of the one true God. Very God, very man. But what's stressed in Matthew 3 is that he's going to rule my people Israel on the earth in Jerusalem. And Herod doesn't like that. Any threat to his power, he eliminates. And that's the history of that wicked sinner. Verse 7. Then Herod, when he had privately called the wise men, inquired of them diligently what time the star appeared. When did you see the star? What date did you see it? Oh, we saw it about a month ago. Because it's going to take at least a month to get from Persia to Jerusalem. They're going to have to go across Arabia. It's going to be a good 30-day trip, maybe more like 60 days. It's going to be a trip. They're going to have to have plenty of food packed. It's going to be a large caravan. We're going to have to have soldiers to be able to fight off marauders and thieves. It's a huge caravan. And so Agrippa, or Herod says, and, and when did you see the star? Oh, maybe 60 days ago. And he sent them to Bethlehem because the prophet said he would be born in Bethlehem and said, go and search diligently for the young child. And when you have found him, bring me word again that I may come and worship him. So by the time the wise men show up, the, the men of the east, the Christ is not a baby. He is now a young child. He's about one year old or thereabouts. He's no longer in a manger. He's now living in a little home in Bethlehem. And so he says, go. Go find the young child. And when you found him, bring me word that I may come and worship him also. Herod at least gave lip service that he was, should be worshipped. Because you see, Herod wants to kill him. Herod, the demon-possessed murderer, wants to kill him. That's what the devil wanted to do. The devil wanted to kill him when he was young. Because if he could do that, there's no seed. There's no future Davidic kingdom. And there's nobody going to the cross to die for the sins of the nation of Israel and thus the nations. There's no one to sit on the throne of David. There's going to be no kingdom. The devil seeks to cut this short by killing him when he's in Bethlehem. 
Because it's all about a geopolitical kingdom. All the devil cares about is his earthly geopolitical kingdom. And Messiah is a threat to that. Verse 9, And when they had heard the king, they departed, and lo, as the star, which they saw in the east, went before them, till it came and stood over where the young child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding joy, great joy. And when they were come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. Oh my, here we have the deity of Christ. What are you going to do with that, all you deity of Christ deniers? I guess you can worship someone that's less than God, huh? Now you can really throw the Bible out. Fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. So, and being warned of God in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed into their own country another way. This young child was Messiah. He was the one who is the heir. He is the one who has right, title, and interest to rule Jerusalem, to rule Israel, and to rule the world. This is very important. He has the legal title to the throne of David through the marriage of Joseph to Mary. He has the natural title to the throne of David through Mary. Mary goes through, the, through uh, uh, Solomon's son, Nathan. Or, pardon me, Mary goes through David's son, Nathan. And Joseph goes through David's son, Solomon. Solomon, the line through Solomon is the legal right to the throne. The line through Nathan in the book of Luke is his natural right. The line through Solomon is recorded in Matthew. The line through Nathan is recorded in Luke. So Christ, Christ has the natural right to the throne of David. He has the legal right to the throne of David. He has what's called right, title, and interest. He is the seed promised to Abraham. Hence, he has the natural right to fulfill the Abrahamic covenant on earth, giving the promised land to the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, which land has never truly been fully occupied by the Hebrew Jewish Israelites. It will be in the day that Messiah returns. They will inherit the land promised to them, and it's about the size of France. It's not this little old dinky thing. This is the hope of Israel. Hope of Israel. And so, let's go on to this hope of Israel. Let's go to Luke chapter 1. Well, let's go to, yeah, let's go to Matthew. Matthew. Chapter 23. Here are the words of Christ when he is finally rejected after his entry into Jerusalem where he declares himself the Messiah in Matthew chapter 20. When he declares himself the Messiah... In Matthew here, rise into Jerusalem on an ass, on the colt to pull of an ass. Anyway, he's speaking here now as he leaves the temple. He's now left the temple. And he says, verse 37, or he's going to leave the temple. He's just about ready to leave the temple here. Verse 37 of Matthew 23. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee. 
How often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, and ye would not. This is his formal pronouncement against Jerusalem for his rejection. Behold your house. It's not my father's house anymore. He called it the temple, his father's house. You've made my father's house a den of thieves. So now it's not his father's house anymore. He's been rejected. So now it's their house. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate because I'm not there anymore. I'm the one that was prophesied of in the book of Haggai that this second temple would be greater than, the, than Solomon's temple because the Lord of hosts is going to be there. That's me. The second temple was greater than Solomon's temple because Mashiach was there. Fulfilling Haggai. And then he says in verse 39. For I say unto you, ye shall not see me henceforth. You're not going to see me from now on. Forever. You're not going to see me ever again. I'm casting off Israel forever. There's no more Davidic promise. There's no more Abrahamic covenant. We're done. No more hope for Israel. I'm millennialism. That's Roman Catholic trash. Now, here's what he says. For I say unto you, ye shall not see me from now on, henceforth, till, until, 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 till, till ye shall say, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. That's when you're going to see me again. When you say, Jerusalem, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. That's when I'm showing up again. It's a promise of his return. Verse 39. This is the second coming. Matthew 23, verse 39. That's the hope of Israel. That Jerusalem would be delivered from her enemies. Now, let's read. Let's read, oh, the book of Acts. That's a fun one. I'm kind of getting off my outline here, but this is kind of fun, isn't it? Well, we'll be back in a few minutes. Brother Eric John Phelps, station identification here 24 7. We'll get with the hope that's. You're listening to 24-7 World Radio. Brother John Fellows back with the blessed hope for the nation of Israel. Which is not the New Testament hope for the Antiochian Christians. It's not the New Testament hope for the Waldensians. It's not the New Testament hope for the Abigensians. It's not the New Testament hope for the Bogomils. It's not the New Testament hope for the Paulicians. The New Testament hope is not the hope of Israel. That is the New Testament church. Because remember, the New Testament is divided between before the day of Pentecost and after the day of Pentecost. Great change happens. It's like America before March 9th, 1933 and after March 9th, 1933. Whole different government, whole different financial system, whole different nation. So, the hope of Israel 
is not the hope of the church, the body of Christ. Let's read some more about this hope of Israel. We'll read in the, the Acts of the Apostles. Verse 1. The former treatise have I made, and of course, Acts is written by Luke, the beloved physician, who also was used by the Holy Spirit to write the Gospel of Luke. So Luke is the author of two New Testament books, Luke and Acts. Should be Acts of the Holy Spirit, really. The former treatise have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach, until the day which he was taken up, after that he, through the Holy Ghost, had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Is the kingdom of God some sort of heavenly kingdom there? No. He was speaking to them of the earthly kingdom of God, which would be the kingdom of David, speaking to them of that. That's what he was speaking about. That's why he came. That's what he came to establish. And in the book of Acts chapter 2, there's going to be a reoffer of the Davidic kingdom. The apostle Peter will reoffer it to the nation, and he'll reoffer it again in Acts 3. And the kingdom will be reoffered to the nation of Israel until around 60, A.D. 60, when the apostle Paul in Acts 28 says, Okay, since you judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life, I go to the Gentiles. Six, year, six years later, Jerusalem is laid siege to by Titus. It's going to be under siege for three and a half years. It's going to fall in 70. And the Jews will be taken captive to the ends of the earth just as Christ prophesied, just as Moses prophesied. So notice they're talking about the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. This is the kingdom of God on earth. And being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father. That's right, the Father is going to send the Holy Spirit, and the Son will send the Holy Spirit. So that ends that little stupid argument, the Philoque argument. Which he saith, ye have heard of me. Verse 5, for John truly baptized with water, but ye should be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. When they therefore were come together, namely the apostles, all the apostles come together now, all 11 of them, they asked him saying, Lord, Will thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? What in the name of Christ does that mean? If it's not an earthly kingdom. The kingdom of Israel ceased to exist when Zedekiah was taken captive by the Babylonians in 586 B.C. That ended the Davidic kingdom. That ended the kingdom of Israel. And so for Approximately 600 years, there was no kingdom of Israel. There was no, and nobody sitting on the throne of David. They were occupied. They were under occupation of the Babylonians, the Medo-Persians, the Greeks, and now the Romans. All occupying Jerusalem as a conquered territory. Just like America today is a conquered territory. Since March 9th, 1933. Under military occupation. From Washington. Need to take my course. And so, will thou, Lord, will thou at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And in verse 7, what he says, Oh, you stupid idiots! I was with you so long, don't you know I just came to set up a spiritual kingdom, you fools? Is that what he said? He said, And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. In other words, you're not going to know when. He never denied that he wasn't going to do it. 
He never denied that he was going to do it. He simply said, it's not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. Yes, the kingdom will be restored when the Father's good and ready. When the predetermined day arrives for its establishment, it will be restored. But in the meantime, you're not going to know what that day is. You with me here? Do you see how the denial of a future Davidic kingdom is such heresy? And the New Testament becomes an incomprehensible allegorical book of nonsense if we do not understand this? Do you see how the New Testament cannot be understood apart from this hatikva, the hope of Israel? Do you see this? So, this was a legitimate question. And then, in verse 9, And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. He just went up north. Yeah, he went up north into the New Jerusalem because he ascended up off the flat earth. Amen. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel. Of course, these are two angels. Probably the two angels that were there at his tomb. Which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. Can we take that literally? Well, that's the only way I know how to take it. That's what the church at Antioch did. That's what the apostles did. He took it literally. Why would the angels say this to them? that he would come in like manner. Because the angels were quite aware of the prophecy of Zechariah. Zechariah is one of the 12 minor prophets. And we read in Zechariah chapter 14. Zechariah chapter 14. This is a reference to Zechariah 14 of which the angels said. This same Jesus, which is taken up from you in, into heaven, shall so come in like manner. Right? When then they return then unto Jerusalem from the Mount called Olivet, which is from Jerusalem about a Sabbath day's journey, Christ ascends into heaven off the Mount of Olives according to Acts chapter 1, verse 12. And the angels said, he's going to come back the same exact way that he came, that he left here. He's going to come in clouds, and he's going to come to the Mount of Olives. That's what the angels said. Why would they say that? Zechariah chapter 14, verses 1 through 4. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, and thy spoils shall be divided in the midst of thee. For I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle. And the city shall be taken, and the houses rifled, and the women raped, ravished. It's going to be one big gang rape. Typical pagan Gentile armies. We're going to steal everything. We're going to break stuff. We're going to rape the women. And half of the city shall go forth into captivity. And the residue of the people shall not be cut off from the city. Verse 3. Then shall Jehovah go forth. Then shall the Lord go forth. Jehovah with me, deity deniers. And fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle. Verse 4. And his feet. Whose feet? Jehovah's feet. And his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall cleave. It's going to break in the midst thereof. 
toward the east and towards the west, and there shall be a very great valley, and half of the mountain shall remove toward the north, and half of it toward the south. And the prophecy goes on. But the one whose feet stands on the Mount of Olives is uh, Jehovah. Jehovah Jesus of Acts chapter 1, verse 11 and 12. This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven, and then return they unto Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet. This is the Hatikva. This is the hope of Israel, of their coming Messiah, who's the Son of God, according to Psalm chapter 2, and who's Jehovah, according to Zechariah chapter 14, verses 1 through 4. This is the hope of Israel. It's not the hope of the church. I'm not looking for Christ to come to the Mount of Olives. I'm not looking for him to come in power and glory. That's the hope of Israel. Let's go to Acts. Let's go to Luke chapter 1. Yeah, Luke, oh, we're in Acts. Let's go to Acts chapter 26. Acts chapter 26. Here's the Apostle Paul giving his testimony. Acts 28. We see the Apostle Paul, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, a Jew of Tarsus, an Israelite, Philippians chapter 3, um, a, a Pharisee, of the tribe of Benjamin. He's never losing his racial identity. He's never losing his national identity, just like us. And we see where he, had, where he gives his testimony in Acts chapter 26, when he's before King Agrippa, or Agrippa, I should say. Verse 26, verse 1, Then Agrippa said unto Paul, Thou art permitted to speak for thyself. Then Paul stretched forth the hand and answered for himself. I think myself happy, King Agrippa, because I shall answer for myself this day before thee, touching all the things whereof I am accused of the Jews, especially because I know thee to be expert in all customs and questions which are among the Jews, wherefore I beseech thee to hear me patiently. My manner of life from my youth, which was at the first among mine own nation at Jerusalem, know all the Jews, which knew me from the beginning. If they, ha if they would testify after that, the most straightest sect of our religion, I lived a Pharisee. Pardon me. And now I stand and I am judged for the hope of the promise made to God unto our fathers. This is the hope of Israel. Under which promise are 12 tribes. Ooh, the 12 tribes managed to exist into the first century without being totally destroyed. That's right. Under which promise are 12 tribes instantly serving God day and night hope to come. The hope of Israel is the hope of the 12 tribes. That includes Judah and Benjamin. For which, for which hope's, hope's sake... King Agrippa, I am accused of the Jews. This is the hope of Israel. Why should it be thought a thing incredible with you that God should raise the dead? I verily thought with, my, thought with myself that I ought to do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth, which thing I also did in Jerusalem, and many of the saints that I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priests, and when they were put to death, I gave my voice against them. Why, that was copied by the Roman Catholic Church when they started their Inquisition. And so he goes on. He says, I punished them. I persecuted. And then the Lord appears to him. And he then is testifying in Acts 28. 
And as he's testifying in Acts 28, he still, we have the testimony of Acts 28, and uh, he has to go before Caesar. And we see now the Apostle Paul is going to be brought before the authorities there. And uh, he's appealing to Caesar. And in verse 17 of Acts 28, And it came to pass that after three days Paul called the chief of the Jews together. And when they were come together, he said unto them, Men, brethren, and brethren, though I have committed nothing against the people or customs of our fathers, yet I was delivered prisoner from Jerusalem into the hands of the Romans, who, when they had examined me, would have let me go, because there was no cause of death in me. But when the Jews spake against it, these are the Jewish leaders, it was constrained, I was constrained to appeal unto Caesar, not that I had ought to accuse my nation of. For this cause, therefore, have I called for you to see you and to speak with you, because that for the hope of Israel I am bound with this chain. Acts chapter 28, verse 20. And so he expounds to them the scriptures, and they reject him again. And now he's going to go to the Gentiles. But this is the hope of Israel. The hope of Israel is that Messiah would come, deliver the nation from her oppressors, establish the kingdom in Jerusalem, reestablish the throne of David to fulfill the Abrahamic covenant. Let's see Luke chapter 1, verse 30 through 33. Luke chapter 1, verse 30 through 33. The angel Gabriel speaking to Mary, Mariam, her Hebrew name, Mary, the English name, but not the Mary of the Roman Catholic Church, right? And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son, shall call his name Jesus. It's the English name Jesus. The Hebrew name is Yeshua. I'm not Hebrew, so I don't say Yeshua. I say Jesus. He shall be great and shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there shall be no end. Exactly as the prophet said. So now, he's going to fulfill the Davidic covenant of 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 14 and following. That's what the angel said. That's what Gabriel said. Those were his words to that young Alma, that young unmarried lass. She's an Alma. All the Almas in the Old Testament are unmarried young women. Except in that one instance where there's a near fulfillment as we spoke of on Wednesday of this week. So, are the words of Gabriel going to be fulfilled? Of course they are, because the re words of Gabriel are just a restatement of the words of the Lord to David by the prophet Nathan in 2 Samuel chapter 7 and 1, 1 Chronicles chapter 17. This is where the Davidic covenant is established. All right, now let's look in Luke verse chapter 1, verse 54 and 55. We read... Again, these are the words of Mary as she's filled with the Spirit of God. She says, He hath opened his servant Israel. He's helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and to his seed forever. What was that promise? Genesis 12, Genesis 15, Genesis 17, that there would be a seed, and he would be the seed, the singular seed of Abraham, and that through him all nations of the earth would be blessed, and that they would inherit the land through this seed. She says that this 
Jesus, her son, is going to fulfill the Abrahamic covenant. He's going to fulfill the Davidic covenant, according to Gabriel. Let's look a little farther. Luke chapter 1, verse 68 through 79. Here's what Zechariah says by the Holy Spirit. He prophesies. And he says, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he hath visited and redeemed his people. He hath raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant Jake David. As he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets, which have been since the world began, since the age began, since the Mosaic age began. Okay. That we should be saved. Now he defines what this redemption is. Verse 71, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all that hate us. This is called deliverance from oppression. Deliverance from Roman oppression. You realize the Romans hated the Jews? It's like the Roman Catholics hate the Jews today. It's like all the priests and the popes, they all hate the Jews. Do you know that? They hate them. And every time a Jew is killed, they rejoice. Oh, goody, another dead Jew. Remember, Hadrian, that evil, wicked Roman emperor, killed every seed of David he could find when he plowed the city of Jerusalem. The Romans hate the Jews. They're nothing but a bunch of Jew boys. They're nothing but a bunch of kikes. And nothing but a bunch of schlemiels. Okay? That's what the pagan Romans, Roman Catholics think of the Jews. They have no love for the Jews. Every time they get in place of political power, they kill them! We Bible-believing Baptists and Bible-believing Protestants, we don't do that. Because it's not our doctrine. We bless them and curse not. We realize they're enemies for the gospel's sake, but they're beloved for the Father's sake, Romans 11. And we never persecute them. And so, this is what he says. That we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all that, that hate us. This is earthly, geopolitical po deliverance has nothing to do with dying and going to heaven. Nothing. To perform the mercy promised to our fathers. It's Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Those are the fathers. And to remember his holy covenant. Which one's that? The oath which he swore to our father Abraham that he would grant unto us that we being delivered out of the hand of our enemies might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our life. That's the hope of Israel. That is the Hatikvah. That's their national anthem, the Hatikvah. And that's what the Messiah will do for them when he enforces and brings into play the Abrahamic covenant at his coming again. I have to laugh. These fools talk about a two-state solution for Israel. There's a two-state solution. There ain't no two-state two-state solution. There's a one-state solution, and it will be imposed by the risen Lord Jesus Christ one day when all the Arabs will be out, all the blacks will be out, all the white Gentiles will be out, all the Asians will be out, all the Hispanics will be out, and only the racial Hebrew Jewish Israelites will inherit that land and occupy it, and anybody there that's not them is going to be a stranger, and they're going to be doing labor for them. That's why a two-state solution today is insane. How can you engage in a dialogue with fanatical Muslim Arabs who have what's called the Palestinian Covenant, and in that Palestinian Covenant of 1968, they determined to drive every Jew into the sea? How can you negotiate with someone who wants to kill you? You can't. 
That's why they all need to be removed out of Israel. Give them each 5,000 bucks. Let the Pope pay for it. And they can all be removed out of Israel, send them to Jordan and Lebanon and Egypt and wherever they want to go, Iran, Iraq, wherever. And they're out of Israel. Send them to Saudi Arabia. There's no such thing as the Palestinians. They're Arab Muslims. Just send them out. That's how you solve the problem. There aren't any Jews living in Jordan. They've all been driven out. There aren't any Jews living in Lebanon. They've all been driven out. There aren't any Jews living in Syria. They've all been driven out. It's all Judenrein. North Africa's Judenrein. They've run out all the Jews, hundreds of thousands of them. So why should any Arabs whatsoever be allowed to live in the promised land to Abraham today? Why should they be allowed? This Messiah is going to enforce... Back in the There's John Phillips back with the hope of Israel. Turning on. Continuing on, pardon me. Yeah, that does turn me on. Hope of Israel turns me on. Wow. What a movie that could be made of this. But those pagans in Hollywood, those Roman Catholics and homosexuals and pagan Jews serving the Pope, they could never make a real movie out of this. That's why I need you to, to some of you to give like about $10 million and we'll have a, we'll make a movie. How about that? We'll make a real movie out of some real scriptural promises. Okay, going on. Chapter, Luke chapter 1, as we've been reading. Verses 68 through 79. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he hath visited and redeemed his people, and hath raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant Jacob. As he spake by the mouth of his holy prophets, which have been since the world this age began. It's not cosmos, it's ion. All right. I'm sure it is. Let me just check here. 170, 170. Yeah. Oh, it is. Yeah. Since the age began. Ionos. Since the age began, namely the age of law. And he says, 71, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all that hate us to perform the mercy promised to our fathers, to remember his holy covenant, the oath which he swore to our father Abraham, that he would grant it to us, that we being delivered out of the hand of our enemies might serve him without fear. Is that dying and going to heaven? I don't think so. This is what's going on on earth, here, on the flat earth. That's right. The Lord sits above the circle of the earth. He sits in the north and he looks down and it's one great big circle with the ice wall around the seas and the continents. That's right. He sits above the circle of the earth. It's not a globe. It's a circle and it's flat. Going on. In holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our life. And thou, child, shall be called the prophet of the highest. For thou shalt go before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways. This has, has to do with John, John the prophet. To give knowledge of salvation unto his people, that's the nation of Israel, by the remission of their sins, through the tender mercy of our God, whereby the day spring from on high hath visited us. To give light to them that sit in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet under the way of peace. So what are they doing? They're anticipating the establishment of the Davidic kingdom. This is the forerunner of Christ, the prophet. The prophet John. Who is he? He's the one of Isaiah 40. But do you see how here this is the, an earthly promise? That these things happen on earth? Do you see this? That is, if we're going to read the Bible literally. If we read the Bible literally, we understand why Christ came. Romans 15, 8, to confirm the promises made unto the fathers. And this is the beginning of the hope of the fulfillment of the Davidic covenant and the Abrahamic covenant, which covenants are unconditional and can never be removed from the nation. For the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. 
These Abraham, the Abraham covenant, Davidic covenant, is without repentance. God's not changing his mind. The zeal of the whole Lord of hosts will perform it. It doesn't matter what those people do. He's going to do it because he's going to fulfill his word. He's sovereign, and he's going to work all things after the counsel of his will. And part of his counsel is to set up the seed of David, the seed of Abraham, to sit on the throne of David. That is his bulamai. That is his counsel. That is his decree. And it will stand, and no one can undo it. No pope. No bonesman. No knight of Malta. No knight of St. John. No, no knight of the Equestrian Order. No high Freemason. Nobody, not the devil or his demons. Nobody can undo the counsel of God. Because he's going to work everything they do to fulfill his counsel. Ephesians 1.11. He works all things after the counsel of his will. No matter what it is, he's going to dovetail it and weave tail it into, weave it into fulfilling his counsel that he has decreed in eternity before he ever created the world's. Yeah, that's my God. That's the God you can count on. That's the God that's going to keep you stable and give you emotional stability in the midst of a satanic world system like this one. Going on. We read now in Luke chapter 2, verse 25. And he writes, And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And the same man was just and looking and and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, of the nation of Israel, and the Holy Ghost was upon him. What does this word consolation? Well, it's the little Greek word paraklesen, from where we have the noun paraklete, which is translated comforter for the Holy Spirit. I will send the paraclete. I will send the comforter. He was waiting for the consolation of the comfort of Israel. That's the blessed hope. That's the hatikvah. Where do we get this idea of comfort or consolation of the nation of Israel? Isaiah 40. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 41. And by the way, this is, the, this is where Handel composed his Messiah. He gets this from Isaiah 40. Comfort ye my people. And by the way, the money that Handel made from the Messiah, he gave to the poor. And so we read in Isaiah chapter 40, verse 1. Comfort ye, comfort ye my people, saith your God. Speak ye comfortably to Jerusalem, and cry unto her that her warfare is accomplished, that her iniquity is pardoned. Just as the prophet Daniel said concerning Jerusalem, the six things that the 70 weeks would do to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, all of this will now be fulfilled at the coming of Mashiach. That her iniquity is pardoned, for she hath received with the Lord's hand double for all her sins. That's the time of Jacob's trouble, Jeremiah 30, verses 7 and 8. This is the great tribulation, as Christ spoke of it in Matthew 24, 15. The last half, the last three and a half years of the 70th week of Daniel, yet future. That is, if we're going to read the Bible literally, and with true history, And now, verse 3, the Lord, the voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make straight in that desert a highway for our God. This is what John said. I'm not the Messiah. I'm the one. I'm the voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord. I'm the one of Isaiah 40, verse 3, all you Jewish leaders. That's who I am. And I am come in the spirit and power of Elijah, just as the angel Gabriel told my mother, Elizabeth. And that's why Christ had said, Elijah shall truly come and restore all things, but if you will receive it, Elijah hath already come, and they have done to him whatever they wanted to do. John the Baptist came in the spirit and power of Elijah, as Gabriel said he would, and he is the one of Isaiah 40, verse 3. He's preparing the way of Jehovah. 
He's preparing the way of Christ, Messiah, who's Jehovah. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. He's Elohim. This is Messiah here. He's not talking about God in heaven. He's talking about Jehovah God here on earth. So, John is the one of Isaiah 40, verse 3. And he is the one that is the forerunner of the one who's to comfort my people, the consolation of Israel. This is the Hatikvah, the consolation of Israel. Now, the consolation of Israel, this wonderful blessed hope, is not the Christian hope. For this to happen, for the consolation of Israel to happen, Israel would have to be regathered from the nations in a condition of unbelief. Zechariah is clear about that. Ezekiel 38.8 is very clear about that. In Ezekiel 38, 8, we read, After many days thou shalt be visited, speaking of Israel. In the latter years thou shalt come into the land that is brought back from the sword, is gathered out of many people against the mountains of Israel, which have always been waste, but is brought forth out of the nations, and they shall dwell safely, all of them. So this is a time when Israel will be in a, in a, a time of a temporary peace and safety of Isaiah chapter 28. Because of the covenant with many for one week, where the final Pope of Rome will enter into many nations for the protection of Jerusalem and for Israel. And this is when they will say peace and safety, and they will be in a temporary peace. And the final Pope of Rome will bring bring an end to the Arab-Israeli conflict by this covenant that he will have for seven years. The Pope's going to do it. That's why there can be no peace today. It's got to be a continual agitation. So here in Ezekiel 38, 8, they're gathered back, but they don't know the Lord. They're in a condition of unbelief. And then, of course, in this chapter, the, uh, Russia attacks Israel. Here's another passage in Zechariah. We just touched on Zechariah. We'll do it again. For this to happen, there has to be Israel has to be inhabited with Jews. For I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city shall be taken, the, the houses rifled, the women raped. Half the city shall go forth into captivity. There has to be Jews in the city of Jerusalem for the Hatikva to take place, for the coming of Messiah. There has to be a Hebrew temple in the midst of Jerusalem. According to Daniel chapter 9, verse 27, And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. And in the midst of the week he shall cause a sacrifice and oblation to cease. To have a sacrifice and oblation, you have to have a temple. And he's going to make it desolate. He's going to be the one that desolates the temple with this image that he will put up of himself. The final pope of Rome slain and risen from the dead. There has to be a third Hebrew temple built in order for the second coming to take place. In Revelation 11, we see that there are two witnesses. This isn't in heaven. This is on earth. That is, if we're going to read it literally. And in Revelation 11, we see that these two witnesses are prophets. But there is given me a reed like unto a rod, and the angel stood saying, Rise and measure the temple of God. This is an earthly temple. It's not a heavenly temple. And the altar in them that worship therein. But the court which is without the temple leave out and measure it not. For it's given unto the Gentiles and the holy city, which is Jerusalem, shall they tread underfoot forty and two months. Is this in heaven? A bunch of Gentiles in heaven going to tread down the new Jerusalem? Huh? Are you insane? This is on earth. This is an earthly temple. And there has to be an earthly temple in this place where the two prophets will come before the coming of Messiah. 
So there has to be a Hebrew temple. The people have to be gathered back to Israel. It has to be, there has to be a city of Jerusalem inhabited by Jews. Right now, there's a million Jews living in Jerusalem. Of course, the Pope owns uh, 60% of all the land of Jerusalem. I had a Jewish uh, realtor tell me that when I was in Jerusalem a few years ago. The papacy owns all this land. So, there have to be many things that happen before the hope of Israel will take place. That's why this is not the hope of the church. If you're a member of the body of Christ, you are not, you do not have the hope of Israel. Otherwise, the return of Christ is not imminent. Otherwise, it is not momentary. This hope of Israel was prophesied. The hope of the church was never prophesied of. How do we know that? Well, it was revealed to the Apostle Paul first. And we read in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. This was the hope of the early church for the first four centuries. There's nothing new about this doctrine. It didn't start with Abel Arnold Gabaline. It didn't start with, with uh, C.I. Schofield. It didn't start with John Nelson Darby. Those are all lies. The early church was kiliast. It was premillennial. And they had the blessed hope that the Lord would appear for them any time during the day. That was the hope of the New Testament church. So we read in chapter 4 of 1 Thessalonians, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that sorrow not, that ye sorrow not, even as others that have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord. Now this is something new. Never made known to the prophets. This we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent or go before them which are asleep, those that have died. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God. It's not the seventh trumpet of the book of Revelation. It's the special trump of God, breaking camp. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds and to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. And notice the apostle says in verse 17, Then we which are alive, then we which are alive, then we which are alive. The apostle Paul believed he would be one of them. Those that have died, then we which are alive. He thought he was going to be caught up to be with the Lord. He thought he was going to be snatched up. He thought he was going to be raptured out of the world. And don't tell me rapture is a Jesuit doctrine. Lacunza never speaks a word of the rapture in his work, not one. And by the way, Lacunza was a, no longer a Jesuit. He wrote his work when the Jesuits were suppressed and for teaching a future suffering of Israel, a great tribulation, and the second coming of Christ, and a Davidic kingdom. Lacunza was murdered. He was thrown in a ditch. Because that doctrine is forbidden to be taught by Rome especially when you link the Antichrist to the Pope, being the Pope. So, we which are alive and remain should be caught up. That's the Christian hope. We find the same thing in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, we read, verse 51, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, well, he's going to later write in Hebrews, it's appointed a man one that wants to die, but after this, the judgment. Well, in this instance, it's not going to happen. We shall not all die. We shall not all sleep. But we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. It's the same trumpet of 1 Thessalonians 4. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead, and dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. There he is again. The dead are going to be raised, and we, we shall be changed. The Apostle Paul, that was his hope, that he was going to be changed momentarily. 
You see that? This was a mystery. In Thessalonians, you say, I, by the word of the Lord, this appearing of Christ for the church, for the body of Christ, was never foretold in the Old Testament because the church was never foretold in the Old Testament. There is Gentile salvation, but never the idea that the Jew and the Gentile would be one in the body of Christ with an equal status composing what's called his ecclesia, his church, is called out assembly. No such thing in the Old Testament. No such thing. That's why we distinguish between Israel and the church. Give no effect. None offense to the Jew, nor to the Greek, nor to the church of God. 1 Corinthians 10.31. We distinguish between the two. And so this is the hope of the church. The blessed hope and glorious appearing. So wonderfully summed up in the book of Titus, as the apostle Paul writes to Titus. And he writes in Titus chapter 2, verse 13.14. Looking for that blessed hope. And glorious appearing of the great God, Theos, and our, even our Savior, Jesus Christ. He's called the great God here, by the way, which is in total agreement with Granville Sharp's rule. That's right, Granville Sharp's rule. And Granville Sharp was one of the men who worked with Wilberforce to abolish the African slave trade in the 17th century, 18th, 19th century, 18th, yeah, yeah, 19th century. Looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ, who gave Himself for us that we might redeem us from all that He might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto Himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. Why? This is the blessed hope that compels us to good works. Because when the Lord appears to translate me out of here, I don't want Him to catch me in the middle of a sin, stealing from my neighbor, or, you know, whatever. A blessed hope leads you to living a pure life. It's one of the keys to personal holiness. And when the Bible-believing, New Testament, born-again Christian loses his blessed hope, he loses a great impetus to personal holiness. And there are more and more Christians today denying the imminent appearing of the Lord. More and more of them. So what's your hope, Christian, that you're going to die and go to heaven? That's not my hope. I mean, that's a reality. I'm not hoping to go to heaven. I know I'm going there. I'm already seated with him there. For Ephesians chapter 1, I'm already there in God's sight. That's not my hope. That's a sure thing. A hope's not a sure thing. The hope is that he'll come today. That he'll appear today. And I'm going to hear the trumpet of God sound today, and the dead in Christ are going to rise, and we which are alive and remain are going to be caught up to there and be with him, and I'm not going to physically die. That's right. I'm going to be changed. That's the hope of the Christian. The hope of the Christian is not to go to heaven when you die. The hope of the Christian is not the second coming of Christ. Those are sure things. The hope of the second coming is for Israel. The hope of Mashiach coming with all these descriptions here, is the Israeli, the Hatikva, the hope of Israel. The hope of the believer in Christ is the eminent, momentary appearing of the Lord Jesus Christ to change us, to be translated as he takes us out of the devil's little dominion here, and we're going to meet him in the clouds and be with him in the air, judgment seat of Christ, and then it's home to the Father. Come home. Come on. We're going to New Jerusalem. And I'm going to meet. I'm going to introduce you to my father, who drew up this plan, and I fulfilled by the power of the Spirit of God. Come home. Let's go to the Father now. What a great day! What a great day that'll be. And that is the Christian hope, the hope that the Lord has given to us. All those who have truly repented. Turn from our idols to the one true God with faith in Christ that he died for our sins, was buried and rose again, and have now been placed into the body of Christ by the power of the Spirit of God. That is our hope. 
Is that your hope? I trust that it is. Brother John Phillips, thank you for tuning in today. I have a book, Vatican Assassins, Wounded in the House of My Friends. Please go to my website, purchase the ebook, and uh, anything else you may see there of interest. I have uh, Clear and Present Evil, which I'm not sure if I'll be able to get any more of those after we get them sold. <clears throat> not that we're selling very many, but Clear and Present Evil, my book. I'll be putting up a new one from Brother Omar on the Wicked Civil Rights Movement. It's called Holy Revolution, Volume 1, and it's going to ought to be a very wonderfully interesting PowerPoint. I'm going to be offering my broadcast for the last three years, 13, 14, 15, and 16, four years. They'll be up here shortly, so purchase something. that will help us out. Also, encourage you to uh, sign up with my gold opportunity. Just go to my website and sign up with that with the, the post that I have there. I think you'll enjoy it immensely. And uh, where you can save in gold and, and uh, build a little business with gold, real wealth. So go ahead and do that. Also pray for me that I'll be able to be a distributor for the Beamer. I recommend all of you get what's called the Beamer 3000. It's going to cost you 6000 bucks, but it will be for making your circulation in your body 30% better. It's a wonderful tool that I believe most people will ultimately have in their home someday. Until I become a distributor, just get the Beamer. You need it. Especially those of you who've had strokes, heart attacks, and others, gangrene because of, uh, because of uh, oh, diabetes and so on. You need the Beamer. It's a great tool, and it's a, a medical uh, instrument, medical device. So you can get it and have it in your house. And uh, lastly, please pray for me, 60 seconds a day, that the Lord would uh, bless my ministry here, that we would have more supporters. Send your check to RBT, P.O. Box 306, Newmanstown, Pennsylvania, 17073. Or you can give online. So until next Monday, may the Lord bless you. Maranatha.